One of my favorite ways of, of uh, doing this show is to take something which occurred to me in prayer in the morning and turn it, uh, turn it into what I'm going to talk about. Nobody, nobody has a guess as to why a fish, why a fish was the show card today. Okay, rather forlorn-looking Nemo, but here's the scoop. Here's the scoop. You know, if you think back over the day, um, which is a good thing to do in prayer, by the way. And by the way, I will say that there are lots of, <laughs> if, if you're, if you're in prayer or you have a prayer time, you know, and nothing is really coming to you, um, there are a lot of things you can do while you're talking to Jesus or in talking to Jesus. And one of the things you can do, of course, is to, is to think about and talk about how unfaithful you are to him. And one way of doing this is to go back through the day or back through yesterday, if it's in the morning, and just think of all of the unchristian things you said and did and especially thought because if you think of all the unchristian thoughts that you had you would be spending all day in your prayer time if you're like me so anyway so when you do that when you think about when you go back thinking over the course of the day for instance you can probably think of 50 times, 20 times, 10 times, 100 times, when you were annoyed by what happened. Whether you were annoyed because you had gone to the supermarket to buy something and they were out of it, or whether you were annoyed because you went to ma mass and you had the priest that you like least celebrate, or you went to mass. <laughs> you can tell I spent a lot of time going to mass. You went to mass and there was, you know, somebody chatting behind you, or you were driving and you missed like every green light by 10 seconds, <laughs> whatever. You get the point. Or you went to start your car and your car didn't start. Um, let's face it, our days are woven out of petty annoyances, sometimes larger annoyances, whatever. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if, if you don't have, your days are not like this. I don't see any hands. Okay. So what's the scoop and what's this got to do with that picture? Well, the truth is being, uh, getting annoyed or getting mad, um, or getting frustrated or getting anxious, but mostly getting frustrated and kind of mad at these petty annoyances makes as much sense as, I'll bring that picture up again, makes as much sense as a fish getting annoyed at the water around him, okay? Our entire life, we're swimming in an ocean of frustrations, annoyances, things contrary to our will, uh, things that displease us, people that displease us, actions that displease us, events that displease us. That is the, that is the water that we are swimming in. That's the water that we live in. We are like that poor fish. If water really annoyed you. Okay. So that's what, that's what this talk has to do with that picture. And then there's a second dimension. I'll have some readings too, to kind of, to kind of anchor this. But anyway, there's another dimension too which is the water that that fish is in is actually its source of life, right? It's where it gets its oxygen from. And if that fish were free from the water, uh, it would die. Now, the truth is 
that we are on earth for a purpose. We are on our earth for our sanctification and to give glory and praise to God and to uh, purify ourselves, improve ourselves and make ourselves um, more prepared for heaven, let's say. I don't want to say worthy of heaven because we're never going to be truly worthy of heaven, but to prepare us for life with God for all eternity. And it is precisely, it's not the things that go our way that prepare us for heaven or build virtue. It's precisely the annoyances. It's precisely the fact that we're surrounded by all of this water. And if only we didn't have this water around us, then we would be happy. Okay. Do you see what I mean? So, so not only there are two reasons why getting annoyed at annoyances, so to speak, is silly and counterproductive. One is because it's the water that we live in and it's just a lot of wasted energy because, because we're going to be swimming in it from the day we are conceived in the womb, probably until, until the day we die. And the other reason is that's exactly why we're alive. And Blue Bear said on the chat stream before the show or the beginning of the show, you know, Jesus come quickly, you know, I'm tired of living in Satan's world. And the truth is that that is why we're here. That's why we're here. I, that's because this is entirely, you know, the point of our lives is the contrary aspects of it. Um, and, and you'll be happier. <laughs> you'll be happier. I mean, you're, you're guaranteed to make yourself miserable if you're dissatisfied with what happens, because you're always going to be dissatisfied with what happens. The, uh, almost always. You know, you're not going to get the green light. You're not going to get the priest you like. You're not going to have a silent mass, whatever. So I, I'm just going to read a couple of um, passages here. It's a passage from St. John of the Cross, and it's advice to men who are about to enter a monastery or men who are in a monastery. The first precaution is to understand that you have come to the monastery so that all may fashion and try you. So in our case, the way to translate this is the first thing to understand is that we are born, we live in this world in order that all the people around us may fashion us and try us. That's another word for annoy us or test us or whatever. Thus, to free yourself from the imperfections and disturbances that can be engendered by the mannerisms and attitudes of those around you, and to draw profit from every occurrence, you should think that all around you are artisan, artisans, as indeed they are. They are present there in order to prove you, to test you, to try you, that some will fashion you with words, other by deeds, and others with thoughts against you. And that in all this you must be submissive, as is the statue to the craftsman who molds it, to the artist who paints it, and to the gilder who embellishes it. Okay. This is this is like total surrender, by the way. Uh, everything is everything is about the same thing. There's really, in some sense, there's only one spirituality. So if you see Dolindo surrender novena and prayer in this you're not off the mark. If you see St. Ignatius Loyola's uh, Receive Lord prayer in this, you're not off the mark. If you see uh, St. Therese of Lisieux's um, trusting God like a child, trust their loving father, you're not off the mark. There's really only this one God and there's one human nature, human condition, so to speak. And if spirituality is the relationship between God and man and the purpose of man on earth and so forth, then in a way, there's one spirituality, one true spirituality. Continuing. If you fail to observe this, this precaution, you will not know how to overcome your sensitiveness and feelings, nor will you get along well in the community, nor attain holy peace nor free yourself from many stumbling blocks and evils. 
So that is one passage I was going to read. This is a very beautiful book, by the way. It's uh, Win Wilfred Stinnison, Into Your Hands, Father, Abandoning Ourselves to the God Who Loves Us. It's like abandonment to divine providence, the trustful surrender, and so forth. They're all in the same vein of just trying to pound through our thick skulls the fact that God loves us more than we can imagine, and he is controlling everything that happens to us more than we can imagine. And if only we would take him at his word and relax and believe all of that, we would save ourselves a lot of grief or to sound Jewish, Soros, Soros. That's Yiddish for grief. So let me just turn to some other passages here. Okay. The omnipresence of God takes on a whole new meaning. His presence is not static or passive. He is not a weak spectator who witnesses how people misuse their freedom and destroy his plans. Right? We're doing that all the time, right? Like, like that guy drove drunk and he crashed into my car and he misused their freedom and destroyed my plans, right? God is not a weak spectator who witnesses how people misuse their freedom and destroy his plans, God's plans. It would be senseless to surrender oneself to such a powerless God. God is active love, and all that occurs and is done by human beings is integrated into his all-encompassing activity. Okay, so the distinction between God's permissive will and God's ordaining will Although it's a real distinction, is actually irrelevant. It's irrelevant when you think about divine providence, okay? Whether that drunk driver rammed into you because it was God's permissive will or his ordaining will only has to do with the drunk driver. It doesn't have to do with you. It was God's ordaining will, so to speak, that you get hit, you get, uh, what's it called, T-boned by a car. The only place where his permissive will comes in, as opposed to his ordaining will, is the fact that God does not actively will sin. He does not ordain someone to sin. And therefore, the drunk driver drove drunk. That was God's permissive will permitting him to drive drunk. But from your perspective, it was his ordaining will that you got T-boned. For those of us out of this country, T-bone is the expression when you're going across an intersection and somebody runs a red light or runs a stop sign and runs head on into the side of your car like a T-bone. Okay. There's no need to distinguish carefully between what God positively wills and what he merely permits. What he permits is also a part of his universal, all-embracing will. He has foreseen it from the beginning and decided how he will use it. Everything that happens has a purpose in God's plan. He is so good that all that comes in contact with him becomes in some way good. God is so good, St. Augustine says, that in his hand even evil brings about good. He would never have permitted evil to occur if he had not, thanks to his perfect goodness, been able to use it. Who can dare speak of chance? Nothing in our lives happens haphazardly. Everything that takes place against our will can only come from God's will. His providence, the order he has created, the permission he gives, and the laws he has established. Okay? That is why that fish is us. And that fish with his furrowed brow, I was very happy when I found this drawing. That fish with his furrowed brow is us. Wondering why he is made miserable by all this water around him when he, if only there was no water around him, he would be happy. This book is mostly, it's kind of a collection of quotes, of citations from saints and, uh, you know, stitched together with the author's elucidation. So it, this book is a collection of quotes and the quote that I read was a quote of um, John of the Cross. Uh, in my in my initial theophany, my experience of God that converted me from atheist to fanatic, 
um, I was seeing that. I was seen. I was shown that rather. I was shown, or I had felt. I don't know how to put it because I, in this experience, I experienced my life as though I was looking back over my life after death in the presence of God, and I kind of felt the way I would feel about things. And boy, one of my one of my greatest regrets when I died would be all of the time and energy I had wasted. <laughs> had wasted all of the energy I had wasted, um, essentially worrying about things, being anxious about things, being frustrated by things, being annoyed by things, all of that stuff. Again, I, I would say that 90, 98% of my energy is totally wasted. 98% of my psychic energy goes to just not being in the presence of God, trusting divine providence. I think you almost have to be, you know, a saint like Maximilian Kolbe to actually, actually not, at least in your thoughts, be rebelling, being rebelling against the water that is exactly the water that is your life and your breath and that you're breathing and that is always going to be surround, uh, surrounding you, whether you rebel or not. So there you have it. Anyway, thanks for watching. And that is why I have Nemo there. We're going to be on the cross. We can be like the good thief or the bad thief because the good thief recognized Jesus, right? He recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was God. He recognized that Jesus was God and we're not recognizing God in the water around us. We're not recognizing God in the circumstance. So we're like the bad thief, just complaining about the cross rather than recognizing that we're in the present, that we're three feet from God, essentially, and turning to God instead. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Oh,